Well, welcome to our eighth seminar segment. And tonight we are continuing in our study on the seven seals. I've spent a considerable amount of time uh, examining some of the seals and talking about rules of interpretation. And tonight we're going to attempt to locate the timing of the seven seals with better precision and see what this all reveals. Last night I explained um, as best I could how that uh, before the world was created, the Father wrote down a book, wrote down a complete history of all of life, and then he put it in, uh, under the closure of seven seals so that no one can see what the Father knew from the very beginning. The neat thing about God is that when he goes out on a job, whether he's installing cabinets or bushes or building houses or whatever it is, the neat thing about God is that he has everything he needs to finish the job before he starts it. Not a bad idea. <laughs> God knew from the, from the very, before he started creating life, he knew what was coming. And he wrote it all down. Because at the end of the story of the drama for sin, and God has set the limits for sin, he's going to open up this book, reveal its contents, and show what he knew before anything came to be. The significance of this Here's a timeline. This is the end of the thousand years. This is where the great white throne judgment happens in Revelation chapter 20. Now, here's the point. This book is opened up and unfolded here for everybody to read and everybody to see and to examine and to study for how long? Eternity. After the thousand years are over, what begins? Eternity. Forever. Understand that we will, throughout eternity, I say we, I'm including myself, by God's grace, Paul says, then we which are alive and remain, he was including himself, wasn't he? Sure. By God's grace, this book is written and sealed up and unsealed at the end of the sin drama, which will be, in the words of Ed Sullivan, a really big show right here. But the real benefit of this book and the real purpose of it is for the saints during the eons of time that follow because as we go back and review and study the course of sin and the course of God's love and all that God did to save mankind, and people in particular, we'll see what God knew before anything came to be, and we'll be examining what he did knowing what he knew. Did I confuse you? In other words, we will have, this, we will have the Paul Harvey, the rest of the story, as we go back and examine every event and look back on it and see how marvelous are the ways of God. And I guarantee you, every time the saints over in the library are going through this and examining things, every time they go to st study a particular event in Earth's history and look at it and, and review it, they will once again confess, what a marvelous God. He knew all that and went to that expense. He knew all of that and did that anyway. What an incredible God. That's what this is really for. This is called the book of life because at the end of the drama, those who chose life will enjoy eternity of life. Okay. No, it'll be an open book <laughs> quiz. All seven seals broken open, open book quiz. You know, sin won't rise again. 
Bible says. And it won't be because God's creatures don't have the power of choice. It'll be because we have the evidence to review. A hundred billion years from now, if there's a question about the integrity of God, we only need to go back and review the 7,000 years of the sin issue. It'll clarify everything. You see, the most difficult thing for a finite being to do is to live with an infinite God. God does something over here that may take 7,000 years to understand. But how do, you, how do you get along with him in the meantime? Faith. This is why faith is the only prerequisite for salvation. If you can have faith in God's ways, if you can have faith in God's order, if you can have faith that Jesus has provided the atonement for you, God says, you can live with me and you can be happy even though you will never understand me. This is a lot like marriage. <laughs> Don't go there, did you say? <laughs> it's possible to have oneness, but also questions. Sure. But with God, because His ways aren't our ways, because the infinite is not like the finite, the only way we can, can live with Him and be happy with knowing that it's all going to work out good is faith. And you've got to know in your own heart of hearts, down to the very bottom of your heart, that God is righteous. This means God never, never does anything that has the slightest hint of shady dealing. This is why faith is the key, not only in this life, but in the life to come. The prerequisite for living with God. Okay. Tonight, I'm going to, to um, challenge your thinking a little bit, and I'm going to introduce you to a new word. This is an acronym. I guess I should put the period there. It's the Heaven-Earth Linkage Law. Can you remember that? Heaven-Earth Linkage Law. And what the Heaven-Earth Linkage Law simply states is that we can't we can't go outside and look up into the sky and see what's going on in heaven. God knows that. But God wants us to know where we are in the order of His events and of His plans. So what God has done is very clever. Here's a timeline. God has certain events in heaven that occur along the way, and He has linked those events in heaven with events on earth, so that when we see them on earth, we know where we are in heaven's order. Heaven-earth linkage law. For example, when the first trumpet sounds, when the, when the angel blows the horn, you and I won't hear the horn. But what will we see? No. That earthquake's over here. What's the first trumpet? Ah, the burning. The great fires burning up a third of the earth, a third of the trees and the green grass. When you see this on earth, you will know first trumpet in heaven sounded. The linkage. Get the idea? When you, when, when you see the earthquake, what will you know happened in heaven at the altar of incense? Sensors cast, very good, very good. You know, it's, in, it's really nice to preach to the choir once in a while. <laughs> it's really nice to, to speak to people who, 
who've heard enough, who have heard this enough times to begin to pick up on it and understand what's going on. You know, you really have to hear this story two or three times to begin to surround it intellectually. It's enormous in its scope and its linking, its linkage. It takes a while. So what I'm trying to demonstrate here is the heaven-earth linkage law, and we're going to examine a very fine example of this in Daniel 7. We're going to go to Daniel chapter 7. If you have your Bibles, I'd like for you to get them out and follow along because I want you to watch how this works. The heaven-earth linkage law really plays in big time. You didn't bring your Bible, Mike? I will go get one. <laughs> That's my way of getting back and making faces while I go. <laughs> Touche. <laughs> okay, in Daniel 7, we're going to look at some parallelism, you know, the, the title of this series is Parallels and Patterns, and so I'm assuming everybody here is already acquainted with Daniel 2, and you know in Daniel 2 we had the head, the chest, the thighs, the legs, the feet, and then the feet and toes, and then the rock. Everybody knows the seven steps of Daniel 2. Daniel 7 is a repetition and enlargement of Daniel 2. In other words, rep repeats and adds more detail. Repetition and enlargement. I was in one seminar and, and a man said, that sounds like girl talk to me. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, have you ever noticed when girls get together, it's repetition and enlargement? <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's guy talk too? I, oh, well, okay. If you say so, lady. All right. All right, so in the, in the first beast we have here is the lion. And the lion is known as what among the beasts? King. And, and gold is, represent, is known as what among metals? King. So what I'm showing is simply repetition and enlargement. Same, same. God gives the same thing, separate um, identities so that they all come together and really make nail it down so there's no no weasel words no way to get out of it so the lion represents the kingdom of Babylon and this is well accepted by most Christians I might add so I'm not making this up and, and then we have the um, bear with the one shoulder coming up higher than the other and the three ribs in his mouth and um, the bear represents the kingdom of the Medes and the Persians. And the shoulder that comes up higher at the end represents the Persian side of the equation because they become the more dominant kingdom within this world empire. We're discussing world empires. Then we come down to the uh, leopard. And the leopard has four heads and four wings and he flies quickly and conquers the world. And this represents Grisha, the, the world dominion starting with Alexander the Great. And, and bronze, incidentally, the thighs of bronze, Grisha is known as the age of bronze. And then we come down to the monster having ten horns. And this monster is most terrible and he does incredible things, and he has teeth of iron, and he, whatever he attacks and whatever he destroys, he utterly destroys it. He is so fierce and so powerful. So the legs of iron, and you know, there are two legs, and we have represented here the eastern and the western divisions of the Roman Empire, as we had the two arms representing the two Medes and the Persians. It's neat how God uses imagery to present the picture. Really, what God is doing here, he didn't give this dream for the benefit of the people who lived right here on the timeline. In fact, they, they really couldn't make heads or tails out of it. God didn't give this vision for the people who would live here on the timeline. 
And Jesus, you might recall, I've probably drawn that a little too far to the right, but Jesus comes to earth and lives and dies, and still the vision is not even written for the people living in Christ's time. The vision, all of this is written for the people who are going to live right there. It's a time capsule that God put in the Bible so that at the appointed time, those living right here would wake up and discover that they're at the end before the end commences. This is the only way to know where we are in God's great plan. Now, I want to I narrow in our study for just a moment. Let's review rule number one. Each apocalyptic prophecy has a beginning point, has an ending point, and the events must occur in the order in which they are given. We find this true in Daniel 2. We find it true in Daniel 7. We find it true in Daniel 8. We find it true throughout Daniel and Revelation. Without exception, it never varies. This rule is always true, and that's why it comes and is, enjoys the stature of being a rule. And the events that God has given are in the order in which, is he, which he gives them. In fact, here you see they're not numbered. But logically, you could deduct, yeah, the head would come before the legs. But when we get to the beasts, you can't logically deduct the leopard not coming before the lion or messing them you know, all around. The Bible gives them in their order, and in fact, the Bible attaches ordinal numbers to them. A third beast so forth. Okay, everybody's with me so far. Putting a few dates on this, we can say that the vision with Babylon begins 605, Babylon falls in 538, the Medes and the Persians fall in 331, the Grecian Empire falls in 168 at the Battle of Arbila, at least that's the way it's generally considered by historians, and the Roman Empire came to an end in A.D. 476. It's generally conceded. Now, maybe you wish to quibble about a year or two. It doesn't matter. But in general terms, we're looking at the progression of time. The ten horns that this monster has represent ten kings that would be instrumental in overthrowing this terrible monster, this empire. And the ten kings are the ten kingdoms, and a king, you know, has a kingdom. The ten kings are the, if you were to look at a map, they represent the ethnic div division of the Roman Empire. In other words, as you look at Europe, Europe finally became fragmented because of ethnicity. You know what I mean by that? When the, and it's interesting as a historian looking at the whole thing would say, it's interesting how that these ethnic groups all became dominant and powerful within a relatively short period of time, all of them together. Who sets up kingdoms and takes them down? God does. God was taking apart the Roman Empire. And, he was, and he's using the age-old ethnic magnetism. What happened in Yugoslavia when ethnicity became an issue? What happened? Next thing you know, we have a great war, and the Croats and the Serbs and the Christians and the Muslims are all separated. Everybody's all of a sudden hating each other and fighting each other, and Bosnia becomes, you know, the, the result. Well, this is how Rome was finally pulled apart, was due to the ethnic division of the Roman Empire. And you've heard the names Attila the Hun. Well, he was the chief honey. 
You've heard of Alaric, Genesaric, Odiacer, these other generals of that, of that day and time, who all in their own way had a grievous uh, complaint against Rome and they're moving to destroy the Roman Empire. But it's actually God. God working through them, just like he worked through Cyrus to bring down Babylon. God says, Rome, you have outlasted your welcome. Grace has run out. You have filled up the cup with your iniquity and your sin. You're out of here. And God destroys the authority of the Caesars and it's over. Well, let's go now to the scripture and let's notice a few things. We're going to go here to uh, Daniel chapter 7 verse 8. Or 7, excuse me. After that, in my vision at night, I looked, and there before me was a fourth beast, terrifying and frightening and very powerful. It had large iron teeth. Iron? How does the iron line up with the legs of iron in Daniel 2? Rather nicely. What does iron teeth suggest to you? incredible strength. Once caught in its grips, you're crushed. No broken teeth here. <laughs> okay. It crushed and devoured its victims and trampled underfoot whatever was left. Now, this beast was different from all the former beasts, and it had ten horns. While I was thinking about the horns, there before me was another horn, a little one, which came up among, <clears throat> which came up among them, and three of the first horns were uprooted before it. Well, Daniel is watching this, and watch this up here on the screen here for a minute, on the board. There are ten horns: one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Rome actually is divided up into ten segments, ten partitions. And Daniel, as he's watching this, all of a sudden a little horn appears. And then we're going to see in just a minute that the little horn grows exceedingly great. And as it rises to power, as it is coming up to power, it plucks up by the root clean out of the head of the monster, it picks up these three horns and destroys them. So we have the eighth horn having dominion over the seven. You understand what I just said? If you have ten minus three, you have seven. The little one coming up then is the eighth. The eighth dominating the seven. This is important parallel language we'll find in Revelation 17 about the beast that comes up out of the abyss. He's the eighth king that rules over the seven heads. Parallels identical. And once you see the parallel, it's easy to understand. Okay, now watch carefully what, we, what we're going to learn about this horn power. This horn, unlike the others, had eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth that spoke boastfully. What this is saying is that these horns here are just dumb politicians. This little horn, though, has insight. This little horn speaks boastfully. Arrogantly is the, right, is the meaning of the word here. Speaks arrogantly, setting itself up to be important. This little horn power represents the Christian church. The Christian church, is, its history is most amazing to study. What happened is this. After Jesus went back to heaven, the Christians were terribly persecuted and beat upon. And for about 150 years, persecution for Christians 
was awful. But then Christians in Rome figured out that if they were going to survive, they needed to make a few simple compromises and acceptance for Christianity would develop. In other words, if you can't get any converts because the first rung on your ladder is too high, here's your ladder, here's your doctrinal ladder, if the first rung is that high, few people are going to buy in. So let's make it real easy for people to join the church. This is called compromise. And so the early Christians in Rome, and, and believe me, there's a, there's a very good reason why it works this way. The Romans, <clears throat> you know, if, you're, if you are a devout Catholic and you become a born-again Baptist, do you understand that in that transition, no matter how hard you try, that you're going to bring some Catholic baggage with you in your, to your Baptist ways? Sure. It's the nature of religion. Religion is a lot of baggage. And no matter what you were previously, as you move to another, you carry a lot of baggage with you. The Roman who were converted to Christianity had all been pagans. They loved the rabbits and they loved the Easter frills, you know. I mean, they loved a lot of things that eventually became incorporated into the church at Rome. That's how it came to be. It's very simple. Once you understand the way of Roman life, it's not hard to understand what Roman Christianity became to be. And the story is, it was the church at Rome that ultimately became the dominant church of Christianity. Rome became the center of learning, the center of authority eventually. And what was standing in the way of this authority was the doctrine of the Trinity. There was a a scholar by the name of Arius, A-R-I-U-S, and he lived down in Alexandria, Egypt. And Ar Arius con con was convinced, and he convinced three tribal nations, three of these ten ethnic groups. He convinced them that Jesus was a created being and not co-eternal with the Father. And the argument between the south, you know, Egypt is down here, and Italy, Rome is up here. The controversy between the north and the south went on and on and on for a couple hundred years. Finally, the church realized, as well as did the Justinian, who was the emperor at this time, that if the Roman Empire was ever going to be put back together again, Christianity had to have one doctrine one church. And so war was declared and eventually the Ostrogoths, the Hurrili, and the Vandals, three of these original ten ethnic tribes that broke up Rome, the Ostrogoths, the Hurrili, and the Vandals were destroyed at the behest and at the insistence of the church at Rome so that the Roman Empire might be restored. It never was, but that's how the little horn plucked up three of the original ten horns by the root. Make sense? I mean, you got the picture? All right. This little horn has the eyes like the eyes of a man and uh, spoke arrogantly. Now, according to the rule of interpretation, rule one, after the little horn is empowered, and again, I'm going to just uh, give you a date here, the battle destroying the three horns was wrapped up in essentially a done deal by 533 A.D., 533. And um, this next verse is Daniel 7, verse 9. And because of the rule of interpretation, rule 1, 
Verse 9 would occur chronologically after verse 8. It's amazing how that works, isn't it? The, the Bible, the rule says, events are given in the order in which they're given. So sometime after 533, we find the Ancient of Days takes his seat. There's a something that happens in heaven that we can't see from earth. So God has miraculously and marvelously connected this event in heaven with an event on earth. We'll see that in just a second. Watch this. So we know about Daniel 7, 9, but let's read it again. As I looked, thrones, plural. Plural. Were set in place. This indicates that God is about to convene something that is unusual. If you went to... Um, England, and you wanted to see the throne of the Queen of England, where would you go? Would you, would, would you go to the policeman out on the street and say, where is the throne this week? <laughs> no. Because on earth, the throne doesn't move around. It's in Buckingham Palace, right? If you, if you came to the United States and you said, where is Capitol Hill? What do we mean by Capitol Hill? Anybody know? It's where the laws of the land are made. It's where the Senate meets. And it's called Capitol Hill because everything comes down from there. It's a Mount Sinai parallel. Well, yes or no? Why do we call it Capitol Hill? There's no hill. It's, it's because it's an elevated place in our land that all of our laws emanate from. When thrones were set in place, this is a big clue that this is not an ordinary event. In fact, we're going to see... In Revelation 5, later on, there are actually 25 thrones. One in the center, and we're going to find 24 thrones around. Thrones, plural, were set in place. And the Ancient of Days, this is a title describing the Father. He took his seat. And his clothing was as white as snow, and the hair of his head was as white like wool. His throne was flaming with fire, and its wheels were all ablaze. The angels encircling this in the throne room are like wheels of fire. Brilliant, glowing beings. Angels are brilliant in their appearance, can be. A river of fire was flowing. So John sees a procession, a river of fire. And this river of fire is a procession as the Son of God comes before the Father. Coming out from before him. Thousands upon thousands attended him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. And these next two, this next sentence says so much. It tells us what this meeting is. It is a court. That means there is a legal process involved. It's a court. This is not a worship service. This is not a picnic. This is not just a friendly gathering. This is something very serious here. And 10,000 times 10,000. 10, I don't think Daniel is trying to say it's actually 100 million. I think he's just trying to say you just can't count it. Words just finally cannot reach around this. The court was seated and the books, the books 
all of a sudden, out of nowhere, Daniel says, up here in heaven, there's this court setting, and the books were opened. Court, books, judgment, ancient of days. Very interesting. Very interesting. It has to be after 533. Little horns in place, in power. Justinian actually issued the decree making the Pope the head of the church in 533 A.D. It was put on hold for five years until 538. But the letter was written in 533. Okay, then we go to verse 11, and we're continuing in chronological order. Okay. After this, then Daniel says, I continued to watch because of the boastful words the horn was speaking. What would that suggest to you? Jane, I'll just put you on the spot. Can we zero in on Jane here? Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to put you on the spot or anything, Jane, but if the horn power can speak boastfully after the scene in which the Ancient of Days is doing his thing, we have to anticipate the horn power over here being effective. Is that right? right? Because of the rule of interpretation. We have a vision, we have a beginning, we have an ending point, and the events are occurring in the order in which they're given. The ramifications of this will be enormous in just a moment. So, I continued to watch because of the boastful words the horn was speaking. I kept looking until the beast, this is what beast we're talking about? The monster. I kept looking until the beast was what? Slain and its body destroyed and thrown where? Into the blazing fire. Where do you suppose this fire is? Was the fire in 476? Can't be. The fire is at the end, at the second coming. I'll show you that later, but just take it with a grain of salt for now. He continued watching until this monster is destroyed and burned up in the fire that attends the second coming. There's going to be a big lake of fire that's created at the second coming. And this beast is going to die in, in it. And notice verse 13. So, oh, excuse me, 12. The other beasts which had been stripped of their authority, but they were allowed to live for a period of time. See that? In other words, when the leopard came to its end, the leopard as an authority on earth disappears. But actually, the nations that it represents remains. What this all means, basically, is that when we get down here to the end, we find a constituent body of people living on earth that are descendants of these four creatures. Let me say that again. Today, living on this planet, the people who live on this planet are all descendants of these four creatures and the empires that they represented. When Babylon fell, when Cyrus, you know, and Darius brought it down, the Babylonians, who were so called, they didn't suddenly disappear and be gone. No, when the Medes took over the world, you were Babylonian one day, you're Mede today. And as it was the custom in ancient times, your language is still the same, your family is still the same, your city is still the same, but you pay tax over here at Round Rock, Independent School District, because now we own the land. The land changes hands. The people stay the same. So the idea is when we get to the end, and this is why, incidentally, in Revelation 13, we find a composite beast that has part lion, part bear, part leopard, and part monster in his makeup. Because the, this beast in Revelation 13 is a 
worldwide coalition. Okay, verse 13. In my vision at night, I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven, and he approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence, and he was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. I want to stop here for a minute and ask you to look at this now. I need, I need to clean up. Let me do a little housekeeping here. You know, <clears throat> I can't talk without a crayon in my hand. How can you how can you present these things without understanding timing? You know, all right, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be real quick about this. What I, what I want to discuss here for a moment is the rule of interpretation. Lion, bear, leopard, monster, ten horns, little horn. I'm drawing this out because I'm going to show you we're going to read the little horn is going to be empowered for a time, times, and half a time to wear out the saints. And then Daniel says, I kept watching until I saw the beast burned in the fire. We'll make some flames here. That's fire. It is fire. <laughs> now we come to verse 13, and we have to start with a very close look because now the order is broken. Did you hear what I said? When we get to verse 13, uh-oh, the order is broken because the Ancient of Days is sitting over here, but with the vision goes on to the fire, and so now we're discussing an event that occurred back here. Orders broken, prophecy ends. Let me try this again. <clears throat> In Revelation 4, we start a prophecy that goes through the sixth seal, the second coming in Revelation 6, verse 17, 4, 1. We have a prophecy that just starts here, goes there. In Revelation 7, 1, we have these four angels standing at the four corners of the earth preparing to let go of God's wrath. Well, that doesn't happen after the second coming. Most Christians would disagree, by the way. Most Christians, <coughs> excuse me, they want to put the rapture here and then they want to put the seven seals and all these things in just one big chronological order and that's not possible. That's not possible. The facts will not allow it. Here is the second coming, and here then in Revelation 7, we have the four angels, and so we have to start a new prophecy. And then we go through Revelation 7, and then here in Revelation 7, we have the four angels holding back the four winds. Then in Revelation 7, we have the discussion of the great multitude that no one can number. Remember, verses 9 through 14. And then we get down to Revelation 8.1. There's silence in heaven for the space of a half hour when the seventh seal is opened up. And that's at the end of the millennium. Now watch. You've got to understand. This is, this is important. If you're going to understand the prophecies, we have a beginning point. Let me change colors. We have a beginning point. We have an ending point. And how do we know the end happened there? Because this occurs before the end. The angels holding back the four winds do not happen after the second coming. So we start a new prophecy. And we go in order for as long as the order holds. 
We have the, we have the 144,000 sealed. We have the great multitude. We have the seventh seal. And then in Revelation 8, 2, what do we have? We have the seven angels who stand before God are given the seven trumpets. We start a new prophecy in Revelation 8, 2. And it goes forward, but not that far. It goes forward from Revelation 8, 2 down through 9, verse... Well, I'm, my lines are getting out of scale with the rest of the thing here. It goes down through the sixth trumpet. Do you understand what I'm trying to say here? You're saying many of the other chapters later back up and sit before the second coming, even though they're later mentioned. See, when John wrote the scroll of Revelation, he wrote it just without any break. Okay? There are no chapters, no verses, no nothing in, in the manuscript that John wrote. He just wrote down the vision. So what, comes, what, what God is trying to tell us and in the rules of interpretation, for example, that is one prophecy. That is one prophecy. That is one prophecy. And that's what I'm doing here. Each prophecy behaves the same way. There's a beginning point in time, there's an ending point in time, and the events occur in the order which they're given. And you know when a prophecy ends when you come across an event that happens out of its order. You can't have the, the 144,000 sealed after the second coming. Bingo, we have to start a new prophecy. But the new prophecy we start is going to follow the rule. Things will happen in the order in which they're given. Well, it's a different prophecy. There are 18 prophecies, 6 in Daniel, 12 in Revelation, and they all line up just like this. Well, we're out of time. Way over. Yes, we are. Let's take an intermission. Let's think on this, and we'll be right back.